Greetings to you all, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. George Xavier Kordza, and today I'll be giving you some hints and tips on communication skills and the doctor patient relationship. Now, the objectives for today's lessons are to understand deeply what is communication, why communication is very important in medical practice, verbal and nonverbal communication, the importance of listening, and what is referred to as reflective listening, and what basically is empathy. Now, usually, we do some brainstorming sessions where we discuss on what are some examples of communication, what is bad communication, what the future is a good and a bad communicator. So imagine if I was communicating like this. Hello, my name is Josh Gorza and I would like to be your instructor for today and I would like to help you with some communication skills and, and stuff like that. Now, <sighs> clearly from the sound of that, that wouldn't be the, the best way to communicate and if I was teaching in that manner, I don't think any of you would be listening to what I would be saying. So that would be one clear way of saying that is very bad communication. But what, why is it really bad communication? Well, first of all, it would be in regard to the way I was speaking, the tone I was using, the pace at which I was speaking, and disregarding what other people would be thinking about the way I'll be, you know, speak in general. So that's one way of, you know, having bad communication. There can also be non-verbal bad communication, which I'm sure most of you can be aware of. I mean, if someone raises their middle finger, uh, I think everybody understands that means something that's bad. So that's another way of bad communication. So that's what we can simply say in simple terms can differentiate a good and a bad communicator. So now we'll be looking at what helps you to become a good communicator in the medical sphere. Okay, so basically by definition, communication is the successful passage of a mes message from one person to another. So in medical practice, good communication would be you being able to inform your patient of basically their diagnosis and how to manage it, and for you to be able to understand what the patient really thinks about this diagnosis, first of all, if they are willing to accept your management plan or not, and also to hear and understand the patient's complaints in general. Okay, importance of communication is because it also helps us develop a strong communication and is important to becoming an effective health provider. In recent years, good doctor-patient communication has been linked with improved patient satisfaction, better patient care, and a decrease of malpractice resources. Now, a lot of malpractice lawsuits have been documented to be occurring as a result of improper communication. Where a patient does not feel that they had you know, enough respect or enough information from one doctor, or they feel as if the doctor didn't uh, adequately treat or attend to their symptoms, they can easily sue you. So be aware of of how important it is for you to be a good communicator because regardless of what you really know as a doctor if you're not able to communicate it your patient will listen to you and if you're not able to help the patient understand some of the principles as to why for example why is it important for a patient to get a heart transplant or why is it important for them to get a blood transfusion because you have to understand patients have different backgrounds different beliefs different cultures, different languages. So it is appropriate for you as a clinician to find a way to communicate with any patient of any kind of background. All right, so moving on. So basically communication is not just talking. So there, there is a, a misnomer or a misnotion that communication is basically just talking. It's not just talking as well. Remember that you can have verbal and nonverbal communication. And communication skills are not fixed or innate, meaning to say that um, one is not necessarily born with the necessary communication skills. You'd have to learn them. And 
you can improve them. I can say for myself, I wasn't the best of communicators. I believe I have greatly improved. And it was through my mentors and other guys that have helped me become uh, a better communicator than I was when I was born, of course. Uh, although there can be, you know, some genetic predisposition to you having a certain trait that gives you um, certain personality traits that helps you to be more leaned toward communication, such as extroversion, right? But even for some introverts, they can still learn some skills about communication and still be able to be become good communicators. Now, physicians can improve health outcomes by learning how and when to use specific communication techniques. Now, looking at these images, what can we definitely see? We have image one where we have a lady who looks horribly bored <laughs> by whatever is happening and image two, which can really show us what I'm hoping that you guys would eventually uh, be able to do which is a good good patient doctor relationship we can see depicted by uh, the lady who's wearing scrubs and smiling the patient is also smiling you know everyone is happy uh, in that other first image um, no matter what the lecturer is saying or the doctor is saying this patient or person was not going to listen to what they're saying and there is a high, high probability that uh, it's just a waste of time. So to avoid wasting your time in practice as a clinician, uh, go for good communication and make sure you do and uh, try your best to be a good, good communicator. Now, in terms of communication, we have verbal and nonverbal communication. We have different... Um, definitions people have their own definitions but in simple terms communication using spoken words would be verbal nonverbal communication would be communication without or in the spoken words that would be in simple terms now in terms of verbal communication we can then move on to understanding that there's something known as an open-ended or closed-ended question now what is an open-ended question in open-ended questions are those that require more thought and more than a simple one-word answer. In this case, one-word answer such as yes or no. And then closed-ended question will refer to those which can be answered by simply a yes or a no. Now, let me give you some examples of closed-ended questions. First one being that the doctor will be asking a patient, do you smoke? Patient can easily say no. Do you drink alcohol? Patient can easily say yes. Do you have chest pain? Patient can easily say no or no, I don't have. Are you sexually active? Yes. These are examples of closed ended questions. And open ended questions, we have these following examples How can I help you today? How can I be of service to you today? Is there anything I can help you with today? Can you please tell me more about your problem? Can you please describe the character of your pain in more details? These are open-ended questions. Now, open-ended questions, looking at their usage and consultations, they're mainly used when you're beginning your consultation, which would help the patient or allow the patient to express themselves freely and uh, more broadly. And then looking at closed-ended questions, these are mainly used to attain specific details from the patient uh, or specific information, uh, which is why you'd want a yes or no answer in this case. Now, in terms of, uh, so, okay, so just going back to open-ended questions. Now, if you are using an open-ended question at the beginning of your conversation, uh, you would need to first ask an open-ended question and then observe a golden minute. So this will be at the beginning of the consultation. For example, let's just give, let me give you a scenario where we have a, a hypothetical conversation. So I can say, hello, how are you doing? My name is Dr. George Xavier Cords and I'll be taking you uh, as your doctor for the day. Then my open-ended question would be, how can I be of service to you today or how can I help you today? And then the patient would respond to this question. Now, 
when the patient is responding to this question, my job as a doctor is to keep quiet for at least a minute. 30 seconds to a minute is enough. This is what we'll be referring to as a golden minute. So, for example, the patient can be quiet and <clears throat> be, be listening, uh, and the doctor will be listening. For example, the patient can say, Hello, doctor, I've been having some chest pain that's been bothering me for the past six months, and it's, it's worse, I'm tired of this pain, and I really need to get some help. So, yeah, the patient will be done complaining or will be done uh, telling you about their first complaint. So this is how we observe the golden minute. Okay, so moving on to listening, right? Listening is essential for four main reasons. First of all, uh, we have to check facts. So checking facts is necessary and checking feelings and checking the motivation of the patient and reflective listening. Motivation is of importance because in some cases where a doctor wants to help a patient, they can only do so much because if the patient is not willing to change uh, certain behaviors which are found to be risky, then it will be really, 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 really ineffective for them to be um, discussing or advising any sort of management plan. So motivation of the patient is important to check for. Okay, so let's just talk about reflective listening for some time. Uh, what is reflective listening? This involves active listening that's one an expression of empathy uh, and reflecting the essence of what was said and what you think it meant okay so for example we have three main types of reflective listening so there can be more than this but this is basically uh, what I'd like you guys to know for now so we have repeating rephrasing and paraphrasing and then reflection of feeling by showing empathy so repeating for example a patient would say Doctor, I have some chest pain. The doctor can simply repeat, I understand you're suffering from chest pain. Rephrasing will be as follows. Patient says, I feel pain after lunch. Doctor mentions that you are not so well in the afternoon because of the pain. Still, the meaning is still the same, just a different choice of words. Now, reflection with, with showing empathy would basically be you understanding what sort of feeling the patient is having and you reflecting it back to the patient. So understand uh, what it can possibly be. For example, patient says, I've lost so much weight. I've lost so much weight, but I have been eating every meal daily. Doctor mentions, I understand what you mean. You're really anxious about your unintentional weight loss. So this is how we can um, be showing reflection of, of a feeling by showing empathy. All right. Then we move on to non-verbal communication. So with non-verbal communication, this is how the patient and the doctors use their bodies and appearance to communicate in addition to spoken language. It is 85% of the communication. 85% of the communication. So this can be done in various ways, facial expressions, such as smiling, movements, your appearance. So for, for young medical students, we encourage you guys to be smartly dressed when you're going to approach your patients, um, because they would also be judging your appearance to some extent. I mean, if you would not be able to, to take care of yourself, what guarantees that you'll be able to take care of someone? And then eye contact, expressing eye contact with the patient. Certain gestures and postures and removal of barriers. Now, in terms of removal of physical barriers, you need to ensure that when you're consulting or discussing uh, with your patient at a desk, you need to remove all clutter and, and devices um, that would hinder you from focusing on the patient. Now, in terms of facial expression, when greeting the patient, make sure you just smile and then you can also use this opportunity to check if the patient is showing any signs of pain by, in terms of facial expression of pain. And then gestures uh, when conversing with someone to show that you're really, really engaged in the conversation, it would help for you to tilt your body towards the patient. And then nodding the head when the patient is speaking 
to acknowledge that you are listening to them and you're paying attention to them. That's one good thing. In terms of posture, make sure you stand or sit in an upright position. Avoid folding arms. So in some cultures, yes, folding arms can be seen as a sign of confidence or as a sign of being well-versed. But in some cultures as well, people would see it as if you are having some sort of like psychological barrier against whatever sort of uh, communication you're doing. Although some people can just be doing it subconsciously because they feel more comfortable with folding their arms. But just be aware to be on the safe side, just avoid folding your arms. And appearance, as I mentioned, be smartly dressed. And in terms of barriers, remove anything that will be in front of you between the patient and maintain your eye contact with your patient. Now, being empathic uh, means that it's the ability to understand and share the feelings of one another. So it's from a Greek word, empathia, uh, M meaning in, pathos meaning feeling. This sums up what empathy is in my definition. I'm here with you. I give you my hope and accompany your feeling. All right, so now we move on to the basic approach to your patients. Now, when you're encountering your patients at every instance, you need to first of all introduce yourself to the patient, explain your role as a student or intern and gain consent because without any consent to discuss and talk with the patient it wouldn't be best for you to try and talk with them because remember you're talking about private information so do show some respect to the patients if the patient does not give you consent to discuss any private matters with them feel free to walk away and move on to the next patient Shake hands where possible, but no need to force physical contact if not possible. So for some cultures as well, some religions, it's not possible for you to shake hands with the women. This is something I found out in a very much embarrassing way. So avoid uh, shaking hands, uh, shake hands where possible, but if, if not possible, then avoid this. Then address your patient as a miss, a miss, a miss. Uh, or you can prefer to ask them how they would like to be addressed. Maybe they prefer to be called by their first name. If possible, maintain privacy by keeping doors closed. That is, um, if they're open and acknowledge and greet others in the room. If you're in the hospital, if you're dealing with inpatient pay, inpatient patients. Um, and then <clears throat> always start your consultation with an open-ended question, such as the example I gave you, such as, how can I help you today? or uh, what brings you in today uh, can you please tell me about your symptoms something like that and then remember about the golden minute um, just being quiet before you can interrupt just let the patient speak because they'll have a lot on their mind so they need to speak about various things all right so that brings us to the end of our lecture a short brief lecture on communication skills now i hope this was helpful for you guys to just understand the basics of communication skills. If you have any other questions, feel free to contact me and, and let me know. If something was not clear, I'll try and do my best to, to help you understand it. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day.